What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. Here, continuing the reading of The Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much to both of them. Today, uh, Chapter 3, Money Within the Market Process, Part 1, Money Production and Prices. The basic economic fact of human life is the universal condition of scarcity. Our means are not sufficient to realize all of our ends. In particular, our time is limited, and thus we have to make up our mind how to use it. Where it's paid work in family or communal activities or in personal leisure, but all other means at our disposals are limited too. Our cash holdings, our financial assets, the size and quality of our cars and houses and so on. Thus, whatever we do, we have to choose how to use these resources, which also means that we decide at the same time how not to use them. Now, the use of all means of action is conditioned by the law of diminishing marginal value. According to this law, the relative importance of any unit of an economic good for its owner or as economics says, its marginal value uh, of a unit diminishes as we come to control a greater overall supply of this good, and vice versa. The reason is that each additional unit enables us to pursue new objectives that we would not otherwise have chosen to pursue. Therefore, these objectives are necessarily less important for an action for for the acting person than the objectives that he would have pursued with the smaller supply it follows for example that the marginal value of an additional mouthful of water is very different for a person traveling in the desert than for the same person swimming in a lake and the marginal value of a 200 square foot room added to one house is very different depending on whether the present size of the house is 500 or 5,000 square feet. Similarly, the marginal value of an additional dollar depends on how many dollars its owner already holds in his cash balance. It follows that the production of any additional unit of money uh, makes money less valuable for the owner of his additional unit than it would otherwise have been. In particular, it becomes less valuable for him as compared to all other goods and services. As consequence, he will now tend as a buyer of goods and services to pay more money in exchange for these other goods and services. And as a seller of goods and services, he will not tend to higher money payments. In short, money production entails a tendency for money prices to increase. This tendency is, will at first show itself in the prices paid by the money producers himself, but then it will spread throughout the rest of the economy because those individuals who sold their goods and services to the money producers now also have larger cash balances than they ha otherwise would have had. For them too, therefore, the relative value of money will decline and they too will therefore tend to pay higher prices for the goods and services that they desire. It follows that still other people will have higher cash balances than otherwise and thus a new round of price increases, set, price increases sets in and so on. This process, this process continues until all money prices have been adjusted to the larger money supply. It is true that for this reason that there are special, it is true that for reasons that are too special to warrant our attention at this place, some prices might decrease in this process. But the overall tendency is for prices to increase. Thus, the overall tendency of money production is to increase prices beyond the level they would otherwise have reached. This implies, in turn, the purchasing power of any money, of any unit of money diminishes. Let us emphasize again, the process though, which money production tends to increase, the price level is spread out of time, out in time. If therefore, 
attaches the different prices at different points in time, there is no simultaneous increase of all prices. Furthermore, there is no reason why prices should change uniformly or in some fixed proportion to the change of the money supply. Hence, money production entails a tendency for prices to increase, but this increase occurs step by step and proceeds spread in a, in a process spread out through time and affects each price to a different extent. In contemporary mon monetary analysis, this effect is commonly called the Cantillon effect after Richard Cantillon. The first economist to stress the increase of a money supply do not affect all prices and monetary income at the same time and to the same extent. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, chapter, part two, scope and limits of money production. How much money will be produced in the market? How many coins? How many paper certificates? The limits of mining and minting and all other monetary services are ultimately given through the preferences of the market participants. As in all other branches of industry, miners and minters will make additional investments and expand their production if and only if they believe that no better alternative is at hand. In practice, this usually means that they will expand coin production if the expected monetary return on investment in mines, mint shops, uh, is a, in mines and mint shops is at least as high as the monetary returns in shoe factories, bakeries, and so on. The returns uh, of the various branches of human industry ultimately depend on how the individual citizen chooses to use the scarce resources that they own. In their capacity as consumers, the citizens choose to spend their money on certain products rather than on other products, thus determining the revenue side of all branches of industry. In their capacity as owners of productive resources, labor, capital, land, the citizens choose to devote the resources to certain ventures rather than in other ventures, thus determining the cost side of all branches of industry. Ultimately, therefore, it is the individual citizen who, through their personal choice, determined the relative prof profitability of all productive ventures. Each citizen engages in, in cooperation with some of his fellows, and by the same token, he also withholds cooperation from others. This selection process of market process uh, the selection process or market process encompasses all productivity ventures and therefore creates a mutual interdependence between all persons and all firms. On a free market, the production of money is fully embedded in the general division of labor. Additional coins are made as long as this production offers the best available returns on the resources invested in it. It is curtailed that the extent, to the extent that other branches of industry offer better pros prospects. Moreover, just as the choices of individual citizens determine the relative extent of the production of money as compared to other productions, they also determine a number of different coins they will be produced. Above, we stated that money was a generally accepted medium of exchange. It is not merely conceived, conceivable that several monies will be in parallel use. This has been, in fact, the universal practice until the 20th century. In the Middle Ages, gold, silver, and copper coins, are well, as well as all the alloys thereof, circulated in overlapping exchange, uh, net, net, in, over, in overlapping exchange networks. For most times and places in history of Western Europe, silver coins were most widespread and dominant in daily payments, whereas gold coins were used for larger payments and copper coins in very small transaction. In ancient times too, this was the normal state of affairs. The parallel production and use of different coins made out of precious metals is therefore the natural state of affairs in a free economy. Oresmi constantly warned of alterating coins but he stressed that the introduction of a new type of coin was not such an alteration so long as it did not go hand in hand with outlawing the old coin. See Nicholas Resmi, A Treatise on the Origin, Nature, Law, and Alternations of Money. 
Part three, distribution effects. When it comes to describing the distribution effect resulting from money production, economists ever since the times of Nicolas Resmi and Juan de Marina typically cite just one such thing, such effect. They point out that the, increase, the increased money supply brings about a tendency for an increase of all prices, a fall of the purchasing power of money. Then they argue that reduced purchasing power benefits debtors because the amount of debt they have to pay back is now worth less than before. And that this benefit therefore necessarily comes at the expense of the creditors. This way of presenting things is not fully correct. It is true that an increase in the money supply tends to bring about higher money prices and thus diminishing the purchasing power of money, of each unit of money. But it's, it is not true that this process necessarily operates in favor for the debtor and to the de detriment of the creditor. A creditor cannot be harmed at all by a 25% decrease in the purchasing power of money if he has anticipated this event at the point of time when he lent the money. Suppose he wished to obtain a return of 5% on the capital he lent and that he anticipated the 25% depreciated of the purchasing power and, would, and he would be willing to lend this money only for 30% so as to compensate for his loss of purchasing power. In economics, this compensation is called a price premium, meaning a premium paid on top of the quote-unquote pure uh, interest rate for the anticipated increase of money prices. This is exactly what we have, what it can be observed at those times and places where money depreciation is very high. Late scholastic Martin Aspilqueta argued that price premiums were not per se usurious, but legitimate comp uh, compensation for those of value. Uh, see his book on commentary on the resolution of money. A creditor uh, might actually benefit from lending money, even though the purchasing power declines. In our above example, this would be also in the depreciation. This would also this would be so if the depreciation turned out to be fifteen percent rather than twenty five percent he had expected. In his case, the thirty percent interest uh, is he has been paying by his debtor contains three components a 5% pure in interest rate, a 15% uh, price premium that compensates for his depreciation, and 10% profit. The same observation can be made, mutas mutandis, for the debtors. They do not necessarily benefit from a depreciation in purchasing power of money. They can even earn a profit when money purchasing power increases, if this increase turns out to be less than that on which the, the uh, contractual interest rate uh, was based. It all depends on the correctness of their expectations. There is, however, another distribution effect of the production of money. This effect is far more important than that of that this effect is far more important than the one we have just described because it does not depend on the market participant's expectation. It is an effect that the market participants cannot avoid by greater smartness or circumstances. To understand this distribution effect, we must consider the, that exchange and distribution are not disconnected activity, activities. In the market process, they are but one and the same event. Brown sells his apples for Green's peer. And after this exchange, the distribution of apples and peers is different than from what it otherwise would have been. Every exchange thus entails a modification to the distribution of resources that would otherwise come into being. It follows that any production of additional goods and services is bound to have such an impact on distribution. The new supply or of product redirects the distribution of wealth in favor of the producer. Consider the case of money production. Here is to the additional quantities that leave the production process. When sold, first benefit the first owners, the producer. He can buy more goods and services than he otherwise could have bought. 
and his spending on these things in turn increases the income of his suppliers beyond the level they otherwise would have reached. But the additional money production reduces the purchasing power of money. It follows that it also creates losses, losers, namely those market participants whose monetary income does not rise at first, but who are to pay right after the higher prices that result when the new money supply spreads step by step into the economy. Money production therefore redistributes real income from later to earlier owners of new monies. As we have pointed out, this redistribution cannot be neutralized through exp expectations. Even the market participants who are aware of it cannot prevent it from happening. They can merely try to improve their own relative position in it, supplying earlier owners of the new money, preferably the money producers himself. This distribution effect is a key to understand monetary economics. It is the primary cause of almost all conflicts revolving around the production of money. As we shall see in more details, it is therefore also of central importance to the adequate moral assessment of monetary institutions. To avoid possible misunderstandings, however, let us emphasize that the distribution effects springing from uh, production are not per se undesirable. They are an essential element of the free market process, which puts a premium on con uh, continual production in the service of customers and does not uh, reward inactivities. Part 4. The Ethics of Producing Money Aristotle emphasized the beneficial character of monetary money exchange, which facilitated the extent and division of labor. He merely denounced the practice of turning money into a fetish and desiring it for its own sake. See Aristotle's politics. This was also the position of the church, church fathers and later Christians. For an overview, see Christoph Strom's Götz und Gabe, Götz, Götze oder Gabe Gottes. Oh, how do you translate that? Um, like a, to spit on, on God's image or a gift of God. Hmm. Something like that. The scholastics did not question the legitimacy of producing money per se. As in the case of using money, however, they stated that money production had to respect certain ethical rules. Nicholas Eresmi and others stressed that all these coins should be clearly distinguishable from one another. In particular, it would be uh, Elicit that a minter produces coins that their name, imprint, or other features resemble the coins and contain more, and the, that contain more uh, precious metals. Orasmus' treaties uh, insisted, for example, that coins containing alloys should have a different color. In other words, the benefits of comp uh, competition in coinage results from a script strict application of 19 of the ninth commandment you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor this is the reason why coins up to the early modern period traditionally had weight names such as mark and frank but this proved to be an improvident choice because coined metals had been as because coined metal as we have seen has by the very nature of things a different value than bullion metal. Juan de Marina and other medieval theolo theologists have post postulated that the value of coined metal should be made equal to the value of bullion. Many uh, secular writers such as John Locke and Charles de Montesquieu have uh, espoused the same point of view. And even first-rate economists such as Jean-Baptiste Say and Mary Rothbard came close to endorsing this position. Uh, they postulated that coins be named after their fine content of precious metals. Uh, but all these views are misguided because, as we have said, the value difference between coins and bullions of equal weight is not a pervasion of human judgment that could be overcome with a moral uh, postulate, but a fact that lies in the very nature of things. The word 
Iku, for example, was on one hand used in the same sense in which we use it today, ounce. Uh, it was the name of weight, but it was also the name of a gold coin, occasionally, uh, was supposed to be in the equivalent of one ounce of silver. Just imagine what if what it would mean if today we had a silver currency consisting of one ounce of silver that we called ounces. The expression ounce would, would then be unsuitable uh, to be used in setting up contracts because it is ambiguous. It makes a difference whether we are talking about certified weights or as in coins or uncertified weights as in gold nuggets. One would therefore have to specify in each contract uh, whether payments is to be made in weight ounces or coin ounces. But then the uh, practice of using weight names uh, for coin losses loses its point. The mere weight name as such is not specific enough. This does not mean, of course, that the weight content of the fine metal should not be imprinted on the coin. Quite to the contrary, that is exactly what the successful minter have done in the past, what they do now, and what they will do in the future. The point is that it makes no sense to call a coin after its content of fine metal. Such, the, such a name does not reduce ambiguity, but it increases them. Coinage in a competitive system would have to rely on a scrupulous differentiation of the coin producers. It would not be sufficient that each minter print that each minter print on his coin something like this coin contains five grams of fine silver, because as we have seen, some minters would offer additional services such as the exchange of use uh, for new coins. At the very least, therefore, the name of the minter and any supplementary information needed to identify him would be required. Present-day gold coins such as the Krugerrand, the Eagles, or the Maple Leaves already fulfill this requirement. They feature both a unique name and they state the weight of fine gold contained in them. The ethics of using money. The Catholic tradition warned in the strictest terms against abuse of money, but it did not deny that if practiced within the right moral boundaries, the use of money and the paying and taking of interest was natural elements of human society. This position was uh, foreshadowed in Aristotle. Jesus himself, when explaining the rewards given to the faithful in the coming kingdom of heaven, used an illustration involving the positive use of money and banking. He stated that the kingdom of heavens would parallel the reward given uh, for good stewardship of money, and that and that hell would wait for those who made no use of money at all. Two stewards who use the money entrusted to them in trade and made a hundred percent profit found the praise of the master and were invited to share in his joy. But one steward who buried the money given, given, to, him, given to him in the ground was severed, chided as wicked and lazy. The master pointed out that he could have turned the money into some profit by simply putting it into a bank. Should you not have put the money into a bank so that I could have got it back with interest to my return? He therefore commanded his other servants to take the money away from his servants and to throw him out of the house and throw his useless servants into the darkness outside where they will be willing and grinding of teeth. This is Matthew. Thus, the use of money uh, banking may very well be considered legitimate from the Christian point of view. In any case, in the present work, we are primarily interested in the economics and ethics of producing money rather than using money in credit transactions. We can therefore avoid discussing one of the most vexatious problems in Catholic social doctrine, namely the problem of usury. In very rough terms, usury is excessively high interest on money lent. This raises, of course, the question of how one can distinguish legitimate from illegitimate excessive interest. 
theologians have pretty much exhausted the range of poss possible answers. And some medieval the uh, theologians went so far as to claim that any interest was usury. Uh, others, others, such as Conrad uh, Summenhard, held that virtually no interest payment that the market participants voluntarily agreed upon could be considered usury. The teachings the teaching office of the Catholic Church has repudiated the former opinions without taking a position on the latter. It rejected usury, but allowed the taking of interest on several grounds that are independent of or extrinsic to the usury, uh, the usury problematics. For an overview, see Eugen van Bomberberg, Capital and Interest. And... Raymond de Raviat in Business, Banking, and Economic Thought in the Late Medieval and Early Modern Europe. It does not endorse on a, a priori grounds just uh, any credit creation bargaining made on the free market. It affirms that taking and paying interest is not per se morally wrong, but at the same time it retains the authority to condemn some interest payments as usury. This concerns especially the case of consumer credit, because taking interest might be here in the violation of charity. Similarly, while interest on a business loan is per se legitimate, some business loans might be illegitimate because of uh, practical, uh, particular circumstances. Below, we will find. Below, we will follow Bernard Dempsey in arguing that interest payments derived from fractional reserve banking are tent. Uh, tantamount to institutional usury. Uh, see Dempsey in interest and usury. Uh, Pierce, thank you very much here for joining me in the reading of the Ethics of Money Production. And thank you to the Mises Institute for publishing this outstanding book by Jörg Guido Holtzmann. Well, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.